Finally get we can finally get on topic. I I believe we can finally get on topic, right? I think that's the thing we can do. Maybe. Possibly. Sure. Hopefully. It's all been my fault, to be fair. <laughs> with all that <laughs> with all that said. So let's take a moment to talk about personal political stances. Like why why we are this is it's gonna sound very cringe to have like a whole why are you what you are? That that type of deal. But I know for me personally, I'm a democratic socialist. I personally believe that uh, people, like workers, should own the means of production, not CEOs. I find that CEOs owning the means literally means that people constantly funnel wealth upwards and not downwards. And that yeah. hurts That hurts more people on the whole. That's just my take. What, uh, what would you say your personal stance is, Beep, and how would you define it? So I... I have about, I have like two, two stances, right? I have the like end game, ideal, super far end goal that will probably, I'll probably never see it in my lifetime. And then I have the more practical uh, vision. So as for my more practical vision and what I push for regularly in my daily life, it would be democratic socialism, as you said. And mm. then for like my end game perfect world scenario uh i would be an anarcho communist okay so like in, in a perfect society so when you say anarcho communist how are you defining that because i know that there are if, if you have like anarcho communism three... like libertarian socialism maybe i don't know okay like, so the What's way, your question? The way that I understand communism is it is a, a moneyless, classless, uh, non-hierarchical, stateless society. Yeah. And when you say uh, anarcho-communism, well, it, I'm just going to go and throw out there a pure communistic society kind of necessarily doesn't have higher or kind of necessarily wouldn't have hierarchies anyway without a state, at least the way that I understand it. But, but when you're saying anarcho-communist, I'm assuming you mean a moneyless, classless, stateless society that also is divorced from all hierarchy. And a lack of borders. And a lack of borders. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's like the thing that'll probably never happen in my lifetime, but I vibe with the idea of it. But what I want to try pushing for actually in my lifetime would be democratic socialism. Okay. I think I'm I'm a little I don't entirely agree that I would like a full on communistic society mm -hmm. personally. Um then again I am also a pragmatist so my my brain associates is plausible with is good more often than not uh whether it whether sense. it should be whether it should or not. Um I do believe in an almost anarchistic uh form of government personally, uh, within social democracy for me, or uh, democratic socialism. I use the other word, the bad one. <laughs> Kidding. Um, but, you know, for me, an ideal government would be one where the government is on a hierarchy, but the government is on a hierarchy where it is so it is lower than the people in proletariat. The, the your, your standard people have more power than the politicians by the mere nature that they have the ability to to vote them in and out like they can they can affect their office that's kind yeah. of like the ideal that's not how things work right now we ha it, it we feel like they work that way right now when you don't know about things like money and politics and lobbying and shit like that yeah um but my ideal would be a, a society where the government is beholden to the people if the government's going to do things like control healthcare or control policing or control shit like that. I would like the people who they are supposed to be serving to actually have power over them. Cause functionally we don't have power over our government. We have, that is how democracy should work. Um, I, I would describe what we have right now as more of a Republic than well, a we are. We are a Republic. It's, yeah, it, it is true. We are a Republic. We have, we're a Republic with a representative, uh, democracy. And that's how we're, that's, you know, how we're supposed to function, at least in the United States. I think that the government has 
a little too much power, not in the sense that it can do more things. I think the government being able to do a lot of things is a good thing. The government being able to make sure that people have education, make sure that people have food, make sure that people have access to utilities. I think all that is good. None of that rings as bad for me. Though there are libertarians who think the government having any power to do any of that stuff is bad. Like that, the government being able to provide you with healthcare is is necessarily government overreach for people like Mark Levin, for instance. And I don't agree with that. Yeah, um, I think an interesting thing to uh, mention with that is how I also identify as like a libertarian socialist. And so it's the idea that I don't like a lot of government intervention, but I still want socialistic policies like, you know, free healthcare, um, you know, easy access to food and, and, and all that, like the things you were describing, I want them to be sort of, I want there to be an option, right? I want there to be an option for you to not have to interact with the government at all if you so desire but if you need you know help from the government that it, like the government's there for you that's uh that's the sort of thing that i i believe in so <clears throat> i think there's a there's a not a fundamental issue with that because that almost sounds like voluntarism which is something that ben Shapiro tries to advocate for i'm, really? I'm not i'm not even that. not even shitting you he has this weird concept called volunta voluntarism where there should be people who can divorce themselves uh, from the government completely if they want to. Basically, uh, voluntarism is what leads to your sovereign citizens. They believe that they already are in a voluntaristic society, so they have like a thousand magic words they try to use to argue that they are not beholden to the laws of the land that they're in. I think, though, that when you create a system where people have the option to participate in society or not, It doesn't necessarily lead to everybody going off and doing their own thing. I think there'd still be plenty of people who, who do that. The problem is that, like right now, take like mask mandates as an example. Your sovereign citizen types, your, your voluntarist types, they are going to see themselves as divorced from society. So they are not beholden to society's rules. So when it comes oh, to like, I, a I'm mask not mandate, like a complete, I'm not a complete voluntarianist. Then um, I guess I should clarify. Like, I would still want people to follow the laws of the area they live in and and all that. Okay. I just if if there's like healthcare and uh, I don't know food and all that, like basic and housing like basic human needs sort of stuff like they don't have to interact with that stuff in the government if that makes sense i'm trying to figure out the best way to explain it so how would uh, they in, how would they choose to not interact like would you have them they get no benefits from um from taxes but they also don't have to pay taxes yeah something like that so then question what would happen in a world where somebody is incredibly rich, therefore they don't have to worry about the government providing them with housing or anything else, but at the same time, they they are not beholden to pay taxes because they can legally just declare that they're voluntarist. Um, well, ideally, if this were to happen, um, I don't think there would be someone who is like disproportionately wealthy True. So this this type of society, in your view, could only function properly if we've already achieved something like communism, where we don't have money and a state to provide hierarchies to begin with. Exactly. Okay. So I think that's that's where the divide is between that and like the voluntarist thinking that you get from from Shapiro, Shapiro. sovereign citizens yeah. and shit like that. Their thing is within the framework of capitalism, where you can have like say Elon Musk could say right now, I'm a voluntarist. And in so doing, he could go buy himself a private island and he could just have all of his wealth hoarded and not participate in society at all, not pay taxes, not do anything, and just leave, just take all his wealth elsewhere. That, yeah, I don't want that to be an option to begin with, yeah. Yeah, and so that therein lies the divide. Yours is 
predicated, or at least to uh, making sure I'm not straw manning, yours seems to be predicated on society already operating in an, in an operable or a, a, a normative way. Whereas exactly. the sovereign citizen type of thinking is that society's okay as it is. I just want to be able to divorce myself now. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Anana goes is pointing out they really don't already, they already don't pay taxes right now though. So they do and they don't. It depends on, it, it depends on who. So like when Amazon doesn't pay taxes, what they do is they funnel money into research and development and a certain portion of that is considered tax deductible. Now, the confusing thing to me is that for me, only a portion of my earnings are tax deductible. Um, I still end up having to pay a few thousand dollars in taxes, even after deducting the cost of things in my office and the stuff that I paid for for the channel. But apparently, if you have research and development and other things, you can completely get that to a zero. Functionally, yes, it does mean that they end up not providing anything for society tax-wise. So that is, that is true. I'm curious as to why the loopholes exist the way they do, even knowing that there are other functional loopholes. Like, technically, if you're a billionaire, um, you can buy a car, and you can use that car and just call it a business vehicle, and buying that car is and now tax, tax deductible. And tax deductible, yeah. Yep. Uh, you can do that with Jet 2. I believe it was the... It's either the four-hour work week... Or Rich Dad Poor Dad, one of the two books, uh, talks about that and how that that system functions. And in those books, granted, those books are very pro capitalist. They're very pro entrepreneur. Those books frame it as a very good thing. Like this is a thing you should be doing. I think it's a fucked up thing, personally. That's just me. Yeah. Like yeah, it's I, I fucked up. Like I agree that being able to do things tax deductibly is good. Believe me, when I. When I'm throwing hundreds of dollars at artists to build things like a studio around me, I want to be able to deduct that on my taxes. I'd love I that's a good thing to me. But being able to also purchase a jet and then just call it the company jet. That, that yeah. one that one I have some 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 personal issues with. Um so my question to you then would be how did you come to this particular political stance like what what happened that got you here i was just about to ask you the same thing honestly but i guess we can start with me um i guess like i mean er early on growing up um i was often at my grandmother's house while my mother and father worked and so like as a kid uh i was surrounded by uh, like evangelical Catholicism and it like like biblical figures were basically like my superheroes at the time uh, growing up like I was really into it and I was really um, obsessed with the idea of going to heaven and not going to hell and also saving people from going to hell so like in my elementary school, I would be this obnoxious religious kid and try to, like, convert people I knew weren't Christian. And it was really cringe, and I got bullied and beat up for it. Uh, but eventually... You I were the real persecuted Christian. I, I was. I was I was bullied and beaten up for it. And then, like, I, I ended up beating those people up back after I learned how to defend myself. And uh, it was like this whole thing. We went to the principal's office. Parents got involved. It was it was a big deal. Um, <laughs> but like it was like at that point that I realized something was very very wrong. Something was very wrong with me as well, and I couldn't figure out what it was. And it was like around fifth grade that I started to comprehend that the world has a lot of problems and that there's problems with people as well. And there was also something wrong with me. And, and uh, I struggled with suicidality at, like since fifth grade. And that was, that was difficult. And, and so as I went into middle school and learned more about stuff, um, I got more and more depressed, but I also learned of a person who was an atheist. I had never met an atheist or even considered the concept 
of someone who didn't believe in God, like actively didn't believe in God and made fun of God. That was so shocking to me. And Mm. that is what really made me start to question why are people the way they are? Why are the people who are different from me? Like what makes them think like that? And so eventually I, I was, I had, I started to get access to the internet and, and YouTube and I sort of went down like the atheist YouTube rabbit hole, uh, which it was really big at that time. Um, I, I was watching creators like uh, Hemet Smetta, the, the friendly atheist. Yeah. Uh, I was watching Jacqueline Glenn, Kyle Kalinsky uh, during Secular Talk. And, you know, that that is sort of throughout middle school i started it was like the the loss of my faith and all of that and you know that that also came with with kyle kalinsky in secular talk he was a very big influence into me starting to learn about politics because he was he his older videos were about religion and stuff a little bit and then he started to go more political and then i started to learn about politics through him um as like an eighth grader in middle school and so then i you know in in high school i'm i'm slowly learning about politics and i'm starting to understand that like i think i lean more progressive like like what kyle does but i'm also not sure there are people who think the other way around and i'm not sure why and so around high school i I mean, this was a very, very short amount of time, but for like a week, I started watching people like The Quartering and No BS and uh, Sargon of Akkad. I was Hi watching there and those welcome creators. to No BS. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was watching them for like a week and then I was like, okay, these people are all the same and they're not very, <laughs> they're not as nuanced and intellectually sound as I want. It's like not what I want out of a content creator. Um, And then the real thing. Wait, you're saying you don't want 38 videos made about Brie Larson every month? What? Yeah, no, not into that. Why? (laughs) Why would you not want that top tier quartering content? (laughs) I like it when he's complaining about like video game ass better. (laughs) <laughs> don't you know video game ass was taken out of my mass effect game and now that that's happened i just can't enjoy it like, yeah dude that scene was miranda talking about her abusive father why do you want to talk about her ass right now what <laughs> yeah so i mean that was a very short phase of my life it lasted a week thankfully i could have easily gotten sucked down like the alt-right rabbit hole in that week i could have easily just kept going and kept watching these videos and then gotten sucked down but i was like no this isn't this isn't that good i i I realized it relatively quickly and thankfully i did not go down that path um but it like i was saying in high school later on like towards junior year of high school there was this person Um, that I was good friends with since freshman year of high school and I heard their dead name and I was like wait a minute you're you don't have a you don't have a dick hold on I thought you were a dude and he told me oh you thought I had a dick this whole time that's crazy that's really funny I didn't know I passed that well and he was like yeah I'm trans like that's just how I am and you know, a little bit more background about me during this time. Um, I, you know, I've been struggling with self-harm since middle school and depression, and I've been trying to figure out what's wrong with me. And I found out that um, I feel a bit more feminine and I'm happier and I feel less um, depressed when I, when I cross-dressed. So I identified as a trap initially And the reason why I didn't identify as a girl was because I didn't understand that it was possible to be a girl. I thought it was impossible 
to become the other gender. But through meeting this trans kid at my high school, I learned, okay, I have known this kid for three years as a boy, and I have not once seen what is under their pants. So their genitals are not what determine their gender. It has to be something else. And then I learned that gender is a perceived social construct that we've made. And, you know, I was then taking like psycho psychology and whatnot, and I was starting to learn more about, um, you know, these advanced academic concepts and how transgender ideology makes so much sense. And then I realized, oh, oh shit, I can be a girl. Isn't that fucking crazy? And upon being a girl um, and my parents finding out, I was subjected to a lot of verbal abuse from my parents, um, finding out that I was trans and, and that was very hard. And I learned that there are other people like me who get abused for being trans. And it's like, this is a really big issue for, for no reason. It's just, be, it's, it's a non-issue that has been turned into an issue and there are politics involved. And so from that moment, I really started to dedicate a lot of my time to learning about political ideologies. Um, it was around this time that I discovered you know, you and, and, and Bosch and a few like ContraPoints, a few other creators, like I really started to try learning about politics and I started to understand how important this stuff was. And I think that if people are going to take something from this, like if you're on the fence and you don't know where you are politically, which, you know, I've been there. Um, I think a good thing to do is to just like look at the people on each side i guess like what kind of people do the political ideologies you align with like what kind of people do those ideologies attract and so when you look at more far right ideologies you they see they attract like, much more toxic people you, you see things like charlottesville like that's you don't say left-leaning people do that. There's no left Charlottesville. It's it's all like the right. And so it became be, very to be, apparent. To be fair, we do have stuff like Stonewall. Yes. Like we do have the Stonewall yes. riots, but the, but again, it's like the conversation we had before we started this segment. It comes down to okay, but what like what are they talking about? Cuz with Stonewall, there were legitimate issues whereas with the Unite the Right, they were saying shit like Jews won't replace us. Like one one set of these people are writing because there's a fantasy that they're involved in, and the other ones want to be able to marry their loved ones. Yeah, I I watched um, Black Klansmen last night for the first time, and uh, that was just a very powerful film, and it just made me think like, you know, things like this, the, the, these awful things depicted in the film, like this is this is like right wing stuff. And so, and, and, and the stuff that's hurt me in my life has been right wing stuff. And it all just kind of settled in my mind and made me understand how dangerous like right wing ideology is. And so, you know, I was inspired by the streamers that I look up to, to make content and to, uh, talk about like the right wing ideology and and the harm that it does and also point out why it's wrong i think that's very important and as well I, I want to get more people on the left because i think that the left has the best solutions to the problems created by these right wing ideologies just moving people in a more progressive direction i think is very important and i think that optics play a significant role in you know guiding those people who are on the fence and don't know so i i think that my biggest criticism with the left is that they aren't the best optically and can come off as oversensitive or overcorrective sometimes and that could be a huge deterrent um i've experienced that with people in my personal life um 
but you know even like people in my chats and in my streams like they were more right leaning but then when they saw me as like a reasonable leftist who wasn't like overcorrective and oversensitive it was it was something that helped them gravitate towards my ideas and realize that the ideas they previously had and the creators they previously watched like Ben Shapiro or Young Ripa 59 or you know Steven Crowder or whoever like the they they started to understand that okay these people were wrong i was wrong to follow these people and i think that's basically it i mean and I, you can ask any questions but i think that's that just about covers my entire uh political journey and story and just, now i'm here awesome so there's a there's a little bit of that that kind of mirrored mine i mean obviously not not mm -hmm. the trans stuff because i'm i'm still Regardless of Avatar, still very cis, even though I've got fun <laughs> comments that I'm currently documenting from the Super Straight video, uh, where there are people who are going, oh my god, what's this one that I'm actually just posting to Twitter right now? Uh, <coughs> person just goes, what? cartoon female with big tits with a bloke's voice? What the fuck? Okay, yeah, obviously you're new. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> Welcome to my channel. I'm I'm glad to know that I broke you and it was it was literally that easy. It was that easy to break you. You're such a weakling. Not you. Random commenter is. Um but the parts of it that I do that mirror mine a little bit was the the discovering of atheist YouTube. Um I think it was I was more comfortable calling myself atheist after discovering atheist YouTube. Yeah. Though in reality, I'd, I'd been one for a little while beforehand. Atheist YouTube didn't make me an atheist. I'd already been one just from being divorced from religion for as long as I had been. Like, I grew up in Pensacola Christian Academy, uh, where, you know, we were taught the, the earth is 6,000 years old, gay people deserve to burn in hell, um, all the all the fun, fun stuff. And then just becoming an adult and not being part of that world anymore... And just kind of existing normally changed my mind about a lot of that stuff. Though, when I first discovered YouTube, uh, Atheist YouTube, I was discovering s some of the right hands, or the right side of things. Mm -hmm. um, at least socially. Socially. So I'd find, like, the anti-SJW phase for Armored Skeptic. I found yeah. uh, Thunderfoot's anti-SJW stuff. Um, like I, I watched all of his Anita Zarkeesy and stuff and I was like, yeah, this makes sense. Cause, cause for me, the previous four years of my life before discovering atheist YouTube, I had been with a partner who was a very, very, uh, virulent feminist and not just she was a feminist and like, I had a problem with that because I was conservative. Yeah. It was, she was the actual, like very toxic kind of feminist the kind that would hear uh that would hear like a uh not a kill all men joke and go yes that one but who would legitimately argue that anything i did was some form of control like um what was an example uh she would yawn and i would put my finger in her mouth just to like stop it for fun and she would view that as like some form of patriarchal control like um, almost as a microaggression. And a lot of that turned me off from that language because I was like, that's not what the fuck I'm doing. Like, yeah. you make a funny face when I do that. And if you want me to stop, then I will stop. But don't... Don't tell me that I'm I'm doing something that I'm not. Um, So I was... I found that very anti-SJW type of atheist content early into my... Uh, my phase of understanding more about atheism outside of just kind of existing as one. Yeah. Um, so I agreed with a lot of those points, and then I kind of sat there and, and noticed a pattern that was happening for me. I had a really bad habit of just adopting whatever I had been watching on YouTube at that time. Like, whatever video I had seen most recently became my opinion on something. Oh, uh, that's interesting. So, like, Nostalgia Critic. My opinion on old shows that I liked would start to mirror his opinion. Oh. And it was it was a weird thing that I, I had to kind of start realizing that 
that was happening to me in the first place. Because at first, I thought that I was just learning, and that's why my perspective was changing, and I didn't realize I was literally adopting the beliefs of, of people who I'd watch and look up to, instead of just taking their perspectives with a grain of salt. Um, I definitely think that's very important, um, you know, with the increase in popularity of YouTube, I think a lot of people actually do that where they don't really question the creators they watch. And something that I do a lot on my channel is I urge people to constantly be skeptical of me. And I say that, you know, I am not infallible. I, I am very prone to making mistakes. I'm a person. And if I do something wrong, you know, or if I say something that you're not sure about, like, I urge you, please look into it. And if, if you catch me doing something wrong, like, let me know. Like, that is, you know, thinking like that is something that I really um, push for in my videos. And I think that it's a message that not enough people hear, right? Because I don't want just, like, a circle jerk with people who just agree with me. That's That's not why I do this. I do this to, you know, put my ideas to the test mainly. Um, I don't know if you, you think similar. I, it's, it's, it's the same thing with me a little bit. It's the reason why I have in, in edited videos where I have the opportunity to do more easily. I try to put stuff in the description, um, which again, the live segment stuff, I don't really do that anymore, but when I have my edited videos again, I'm going to go back to doing so. Because I want people to check me. I've been wrong. Hell, there was a video yeah. where I made a comment, and Aaron Raw, of all people, was the one to correct me on it. And I was like, oh, shit. I farted up. Yeah. Um, but, so after, after realizing that I was uh, merely adopting, basically, whatever recent YouTuber uh, whose opinion it was I was watching, I started almost mentally categorizing what my beliefs were so that I could note if they had changed because of something. So, for instance, I know that my position changed uh, changed when I watched Vosh. My position on uh, stuff like socialism started to change when I watched him. But unlike when I was watching stuff like Nostalgia Critic and, and Thunderfoot, all he did was budge me on positions instead of me flipping to whatever he believed. Because there's stuff I don't, I don't agree with Vosh on. Like flat yeah. out i don't want to go through the list of things that i don't agree with vosh on but the fact that i even have that now as opposed to what was happening before where i was like no i wholesale agree with everything this content creator just said mm -hmm. um is is i think it, that's a lot healthier it is a lot healthier because there's a sense of your individuality that literally doesn't exist if the only positions you have are posi the positions that some random youtuber who doesn't even know you exist beliefs yeah. and that's that's kind of where i ended up sitting was realizing okay i need to figure out what my personal positions are so i started evaluating things a little more internally so like why am i a socialist well it's not because of some argument that Vosh said i i don't mm -hmm. care for the reasons that that he has his political positions mine is i've worked minimum wage jobs i've worked low-paying jobs i've seen the things that I had to do to move up in management, and they were not become a better worker. They weren't. When I became a manager at Quick Trip, it wasn't because I was a better worker than anybody at my work. It was because I was literally identifying the exact things that I needed to do to make particular managers like me so that they would suggest me to hire management so that I could get my, uh, my promotion. I was not working better. I was not doing a better job. I was not engaging in, yeah. you know, uh, in a meritocracy, I was literally abusing politics. And that was the way it was at, at, at any, any time that I gained a management position. When I gained management at McDonald's, it wasn't because I was a better worker than anybody else. There were better workers there. It was because I personally knew the manager before walking in because we'd worked before together. And I had previous manager training. So they were like, okay, so you're qualified and you know the people here. So I guess you'll get management position like that. Realizing that that environment is something that let's say you're not neurotypical. It is so much harder for you to move up in management and not because you're a worse worker than anyone else, but because it's harder for you to identify what people that you basically have to manipulate around you to get your promotion from. Mm -hmm. Like 
that's not fair. And when I realize that that's not fair, and that's also the way the world works, you got two options. Either change yourself, or find a way to change the world. Well, yeah. changing yourself is only an it's option. not going to do much. <laughs> yeah, change, changing myself is only an option for me. Not everybody has that option. Not everybody has that ability. So instead of looking at this individualistically, look at it as, okay, no, this is this is actually not right. The world is not in a good state. I don't like the way it operates. How would I organize it to make it better? And my position is that while the other workers around me are better at identifying, in most cases, whether I'm actually doing a good job versus the manager who can tell off of the 10 seconds he hopped on the line that day. That could be the 10 seconds that I was having a sneezing fit or some shit. Who knows? Yeah. Um, I was like, well, maybe the, the workers should be more in control. Well, then how, how... Like, we still need management. I've been in jobs long enough to know that without management, you're fucked. Okay, so the workers need to be able to pick their leaders, but their leaders don't need to be able to stay in power for as long as they want. So then I went, okay, so that's that's more democratic socialism. I want the workers to own their means of production. And I want the leadership to be chosen from within the workers, because that was another thing that was happening when I was at QT, is that we would hire people off the street who had no idea what the fuck they were doing as managers. And it was one of the things that caused me to get angry at my upper management, as I literally told my, uh, my district... I can do this job better than them. Why are you letting them take these positions from me? Like, okay, so maybe the workers need to be the ones who are more in control of this. Uh, you know, who who's leading them as well as everything else. And then other shit would happen. So, like, when I was working at McDonald's as a manager, I became a manager, and I didn't get manager pay for another three months. I had to fight for it for ages. Why was I having to fight for the pay of my position? Why was yeah. I having to do that? If like I I work a minimum wage job right now and I have worked another one before. I've only had two jobs in my life. Um I'm relatively young, but like just working one of these jobs like made me very aware of what the term like wage slavery is. Cause, cause uh, because what I, options do you have? I've I've seen, I, I've worked with people who they don't like. That's all they have, and and they have to work like three jobs. Like the job that they're working with me on is just one of the three jobs they work on, and they they need to work more to survive. And uh, so just like working there made me understand that concept, and through understanding that concept, I you know, kind of went on like a Wikipedia quest to just like look at all of these terms connected to the term wage slavery. And it really, it really kind of opened my eyes. Um, I haven't really read any like official theory, but I've read a lot of Wikipedia. <laughs> you won't. So I will, I will say this as somebody who's read Marx, who's read Kropotkin, uh, who's, who's currently reading more stuff. I I did not personally gain anything when I read theory. I, I didn't. I gained perspective. I was like, oh, this is where these, these ideas come from. Mm -hmm. And that was neat. But I didn't get anything outside of that. Like I, I didn't, I didn't. My politics didn't change when I read Conquest of Bread. My politics didn't change when I read the Communist Manifesto. All they did is give me perspective on, oh, this is how these different thinkers think, uh, which I think is also a, a good thing for me because that stopped that weird cycle of adopting whatever thing I had just read or just watched. Um, so, like, if you could reset time, like you would read them again. If I reset time, I would read them again. Because it's, I think it's still good to have read them. Yeah. Did I okay. did I gain anything that changed me as a person? No, I didn't. But did I at least gain the knowledge that uh, I can understand where these people are coming from? Yes. So when somebody says like, you know, all leftists are are a monolith, like they've all got one way of thinking and it's and it's toxic or what have you, and then you point out, dude, Conquest of Red literally begins with with uh, Kropotkin going, no, fuck Marx. 
He literally just begins with <laughs> these with Marx was right on some stuff, and here's this laundry list of things I don't agree with him on, and here's why. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So get that's even the people who form the basis for a lot of of ideas on the left do not have this monolithic thinking. That's not a thing there. There um, is a good amount of disagreement in the left. Uh, there's all there's all these funny memes about like the left uh, constantly fighting itself, uh, and I think to an extent, you know, it's healthy to have disagreements with people, but sometimes in the left, it's a little toxic. A little? No, no, no. The left is a fucking Ouroboros. <laughs> we consume ourselves. That is what yeah. we do. Yeah. And I and I I hate it because it is so much easier to unite it should be easier to unite the left because uniting the left is uniting them against an enemy it, it it should be easy it's so much easier to get people to do accept their differences if they have a common enemy that's that's the just right is so good at it <laughs> yes and like how how hard is it to just go yeah no let's take a look at this objectively capitalism is a bad how do we mm -hmm. how do we get rid of this system or at the very least pragmatically how do we warp and shape this system so that people are not abused under it if we cannot abolish capitalism like in the united states i don't see us abolishing capitalism here i don't me neither but can i see us putting in a variety of social safety nets so that people can at least function here without harm that I do see happening realistically. I, I think it's pretty plausible that we can optimize the capitalist system that we live in to be more livable. Yeah, than to at least be better. Is. Yeah. And so, like, definitely. If you look at that and just go, okay, look, we agree an enemy is capitalism. We agree that it's a giant monster. And, it's, and it, at the end of the day, we're basically attacking an idea. It's very hard to attack an idea and kill it. So, how are we going to handle this? And can we not just do it together? And then you get people, who, you get like a class reductionist come in and go, no, you don't understand. There's no such thing. As <laughs> racism isn't the issue. Class warfare is the issue. And it's like, yes, yeah. you're not wrong that, that, that class warfare and racism are linked. We have a concept for that. It's called intersectionality. Yeah. It's like, you're not wrong. But if we can only fix one right now... Can we not do that? <laughs> and yet you get the you get the fighting you get the constant fighting still of people just going no we have to do it this way I'm like dude we can we can do this multiple ways if you want to if you want to be a class reductionist and you want to go in and try to tackle everything from the perspective of a class and then a random uh, neolib comes in and wants to tackle things based just on race if that neolib pushes the the Overton window closer to our side that's still better that's a good thing that's yeah. still better than just saying no you're not left enough fuck you i agree i definitely agree um like in the case of biden he's he's a neoliberal he has a lot of flaws but he is not pushing us actively like backwards like what the trump administration did uh if the anything trump administration was regressive like, if anything, Biden is pushing things more socially left, which is good. Yes. Even if there's a lot of things economically that he's just not doing well enough for us right now. But that's... Absolutely. That's all the fucking Democrats, honestly. Yeah, it's 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 simply just what is the lesser evil and pick that. It, that's literally what it is. Not to mention, like, in, in United States politics... We only have the option of the lesser evil. In a perfect world, I would be able to vote for a real, like, true blue socialist coming in and actually, like, finding a way to give more power to workers, making it a lot harder for unions to be busted by corporations, getting rid of anti-union propaganda from places like Walmart. Like, a lot of that would be really good and useful. Yeah. But unfortunately, in the United States, as it exists right now, we can't. There are steps we can take to get us there, like things like ranked choice voting. Problem is the winner take all voting mathematically always works out to two parties. It always. does not work in favor of three party, like a third party or, you know, anything yeah. like that. Like you can it's, it's just mathematically not plausible. Like you can either change the governmental structure and have a parliament, uh, parliamentary, 
which I don't think we're going to have. Or you can change the voting structure and have something like a transferable vote. Those are realistic solutions to the problem of our two-party system. The realistic solution is not sitting there and, and whining about the fact that we have two parties and that it's bad and then choosing not to vote, basically. Yeah. Or throwing, or throwing away a vote. Those are not pragmatic solutions. They make you feel better. Sure, they're cool. And you have every right to do that. I'm not going to shame you for doing that. But you have to also understand that in the world you live in, they don't do anything. And maybe this is the prag maybe this is the pragmatist that's talking. Maybe this is the 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 utilitarian part of me that's like, if it's not accomplishing something, stop fucking doing it. Maybe. I am <laughs> I am big into the idea that you have to work within the system to fundamentally change it. Um you know, there are people who have more revolutionary thinking. I like it, but I think I'm I lean more on you know, change from within the system. That's kind of where I sit too. I think change from within the system is the more practical solution. Yes. However, I am also not going to dissuade somebody from from wanting a more revolutionary position. Of course. Because, because again, we have the same enemy. My only issue is like like if somebody if somebody starts a a uh a protest which is functionally working from without the system you are not working within the mechanisms of the system at that point you are trying to work from without to change things that are within i'm for that i support that i, I do. do too at the same time you also have to be doing things from within the system because you are not stronger than it as an individual unfortunately Yeah, I agree. <laughs> also, somebody just said, I hope you joined the Big 40 in the comment on my What the Fuck is Super Straight video. What the fuck is the Big 40? I don't know. You tell me. I have no idea. Guess somebody will have to tell me that in the comment section of this video. I guess at that point, Miss Peep, do you have any closing comments where this is all concerned? We've we've gone through the, the deluge of laments of the united states political system yeah 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 uh i mean i'm gonna do another stream in like 10 minutes um on my channel just playing like the last of us part two but um you know if you care about politics or if you're not sure about where you are politically um you know other creators online are a good place to look to get inspiration but please like be very very skeptical of them and it's very good to have conversations like what Cyrus and I did where you introspect and reflect on why you believe what you do i mean even if you currently already are aligned somewhere politically it's good to you know you know whether it's just with yourself and you're writing it down or if you're talking with another person to introspect and to think about why do I think the way I think? Uh, I think that's a very healthy thing. And I don't think that a lot of people do it. Um, and, and that's, that's not good. I think, pe I think more people should have these healthy discussions where you sort of evaluate what you believe. And through doing that, you know, you could sort of filter out your ideas and say, oh, okay, this idea doesn't sound as good once I start to think about it. And maybe I should change a little bit on this or look more into it. Um, and you could also, it also helps you know, like, what do I know really well? And what don't I know that well? What do I need to learn more on? And I think that that's very important. And I think that's the main message and takeaway from this video. I think my takeaway from this is that uh, Nekos are better at politics than Ben Shapiro. <laughs> that's my takeaway, personally. I, that's that's what you should take. Hear all of your political opinions from cartoon cat girls. Never hear it from uh, <laughs> people who, who say wet-ass P-word. That's my yes. position. And yes. I think I'm going to stick to it. With that said, if you guys enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. There's a link in the description to Mrs. Peep's channel. Please go ahead and check her channel out. If you enjoy politics and gaming content, then that is the majority of what you will get over there. 
with all that said, thank you all for tuning in.